Welcome everyone to QuickBooks Online Updates Q1 2022. This is part of the advanced webinar series that I do. My name is Hector Garcia. I'm doing these webinars about once a quarter. These are free to the public. They get run live via Zoom for the people that register to watch them live. And we record them and post them into uh, my YouTube channel a little bit uh, later on. So what are we going to be talking about today? So number one, we are going to be discussing three new features inside QuickBooks Online, and it's going to be the audit log data expansion to seven years. We'll briefly discuss that. The new QBO plus MailChimp integration. I'm sure you saw the gazillion uh, Super Bowl commercials and are wondering, well, what's, what's the deal? What's, how is MailChimp and QBO going to be working together so we'll be discussing that and then we're going to discuss a new beta feature of some sort that um that my friend kathy i saw that in her youtube channel uh discovered in her quickbooks file and uh, i'm just going to go go through it i don't have any files that have that feature active but somehow this her file had it so we're going to discuss that briefly then we're going to be talking about quickbooks online accountant there's two big things that have been added in the last couple of months. One is the new uncategorized transaction client collaborator. It's going to be a game changer for a lot of accountants, really worth of um, worth looking at, and it might work really, really well. And the other one is uh, Pro Advisor Preferred Pricing Shared Revenue Program. Let me get the microphone a little bit closer here. So I should, this sound, this should be, give me a minute. This should be better, okay? So that's gonna be the QuickBooks Online Accountant features. And then we're gonna be talking about QuickBooks Online Advanced Only features. We're gonna be talking about the new expense management feature. We'll be talking about the PandaDoc integration for custom forms. We're gonna be discussing the custom report builder with pivot tables. And I'll quickly give you my opinion about the new QBO desktop app for Windows that's strictly for uh, QuickBooks Online Advanced. So we're going to go through the slides here and then briefly we'll jump in and do um, a quick demo. So I'll start with uh, the fact that QuickBooks Online expanded the audit log history to seven years. This is technically not, not a feature. This is a bug fix. All accounting software in the United States should have seven years on, of audit logs because the audit period for IRS tax returns is uh, recommended to have seven years worth of history. So all, all you're gonna see different is uh, you will, when you see the audit log of any specific transaction or of the entire uh, QuickBooks file, you will see up to seven years of audit log. That doesn't mean that you're limited to seven years for your, um, for your uh, uh, data history. You're gonna be able to have data or history Forever, you can have 10 years, 20 years, whatever years worth of data you entered. This is audit log history, which is different, which means changes within a specific transaction or, um, or, well, yeah, that's it. <laughs> changes within a specific transactions or transactions being deleted, um, that, that sort of thing. So yes, as a reminder, a uh, link to the slides is gonna be uh, down in the description or in the Zoom, it will be in the, in the chat box so you can be able to uh, get those. So that's really all it is. We love it. Um, I don't think anyone would be against such a feature in many ways. I think that was sort of granted. The other thing I want to uh, talk briefly is um, QuickBooks announced a feature called Get Paid Up Front, which is actually uh, somewhere between invoice financing and invoice factoring. That's really kind of what it is. And you do need to have uh, QuickBooks payments, the merchant account turned on, and QuickBooks Capital for this to work. And I'm gonna tell you wh why I like this feature. So even though I'm generally against factoring or any sort of expensive uh, invoice receivable, receivable tools, like I have a lot of clients that, that, that they go to a factor and they pay 3%, 2 to 3% per month to get their invoice finance. But what I really love about this, and I think that Intuit, once this goes live and people start using it, I think they will be best in class in probably the entire industry of you know tech software, accounting software, providing invoice financing, which is they're combining their merchant services 
and their invoice financing into one product. So if you issue an invoice <clears throat> to a customer and you have your active QuickBooks Capital account and you say, into it, pay me up front for this invoice. Into it will <clears throat> front that invoice for 3% or 2.9%. I, I, I think the percentage might be subject to change. Um, I put a link in the in the in the slide so you can go to the actual page that explains it in detail because this is not available in all QuickBooks files yet. But it, it explained this is how this worked in January and, and I've got some additional clarification. So you will get funding on that invoice based on the face value of the invoice. This is not factoring, which means this is not dependent on how good your customer is. It's dependent on your relationship with Intuit and QuickBooks <coughs> and QuickBooks Financial. So <coughs> it's totally a, 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 a invoice uh, factoring service. However, if the customer ends up paying you with a credit card using QuickBooks Finance, uh, sorry, QuickBooks Payments with the merchant account, that's the same fee, it's the same 2.9%, and you don't get paid, you don't get charged twice. So if you get paid within the 30 days of that invoice financing with a credit card, you only pay the merchant fee. In other words, if you were gonna get paid with a credit card anyway, whether it was up front or 30 days later, you are getting, at no additional cost, funding for your invoicing. So I think that combination of the two, it, 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 that combination of the two, uh, invoice financing and, um, and merchant in, inside the same transaction, I think is what's powerful and what's different. So for that, I like. In general, I'm not a big fan of invoice financing because it's really expensive. 3% per month, 2% per month. We're talking about 24 to 36% APR, essentially. But if you're going to get paid with a credit card, pay that fee anyway, you know, um, I, I think it might be worth it. So I like it uh, for that reason. I Let's call it, I approve of it uh, for that reason. Okay, so let's go into the new <clears throat> invoice estimate layout. I think it's going to be av available in all versions of QBO. I say I think because this is not available anywhere else. As a matter of fact, I, don't, I have about 100 customers, 100 people in QuickBooks Online, and I don't have any one customer that has this new estimate invoice and estimate layout. I had to ask my friend Kathy, who has a, a YouTube channel, and I'll put, a, I'll put a link to her YouTube channel as well in the description, but I had to go to her YouTube channel and see a video where she was also a, surpri a surprise um, of it. So basically what they've done, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up the I'm going to open it up in the, in, the, in, in the screen as a demo so you can see it. But basically what they did is they took the invoice, the way it looks like when it gets printed, and they laid it out on the screen so you can edit the invoice. By edit means invoice number, date, customer name, that sort of thing. Items, products, rates. Edit as if you're sort of working on the print preview version. And what that does is that that creates an experience that's more like when someone creates an invoice in Word or Excel, where it's sort of what you see is what you get. So what you're seeing on the screen is what it looks like when it gets printed. Now, that's a big change from what we're used to in the QuickBooks world, where we log in to see an invoice and it looks completely different than what it looks like when it gets printed. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. I love the concept. It's missing tons of things. I did a whole checklist of things that is missing, but I love the, con the concept and I like where it's going. <clears throat> so I'm gonna show you that. Um, actually, uh, let me go through the things that, uh, I'll go through just this checklist here and you'll have the slides of other things that I think it's missing or that I like and don't like about it. Number one, I love the live preview. I love knowing what it's gonna look like in PDF or an email before I send it. Um, I love being able to enable and disable fields on the fly. That's really cool. We'll show you that. I love the activity log on the right-hand side. I'll show you that as well. <clears throat> it's unclear to me if this works with custom fields. It happens to be that this beta version, it's in a plus edition. And I don't know if the new advanced custom fields work on it. Who knows? If I had to guess, I'm going to guess no. Um, it's unknown who is getting this feature. Is it? Is it uh, all customers? Is it? 
customers with accountants, customers without accountants. That's not clear to us. Like I said, I have 100 customers. None of them have it. And my friend Kathy, another bookkeeper, another accountant, is the one that founded by by chance, right? Um, you can't edit the customer email on the edit screen. I didn't like that because I'm used to being able to see that customer email. It only works with invoices and estimates, so we, we need this to be consistent in a credit memo, sales receipt, refund receipt, and purchase order. Otherwise, I go crazy when I have one interface for one transaction type and another interface for a different transaction type. There's no way to change the layout on this version so the objects are placed where they are you can change the color scheme a little bit, but you can't change them in order, like you can do with PandaDoc, for example, or with QuickBooks Desktop, for that matter. Um, you cannot resize the logos, so logo is gonna be in a, in a single place. For some reason, they left out internal invoice memo, which makes sense because I never prints out anyway, uh, but they left it out, so there's no place for me to enter that data, no good. Uh, and also, there's no way to see the history of the previous transactions that way you could do it with the old mode. So let me get out of slides and let's get into QBO so we can see what that looks like. And hopefully it makes more sense once you actually see it on the screen. So I'm gonna go to new and I'm gonna go to invoice. So nothing really changes here. It's just going to new invoice. But now what you're gonna see, and I'm gonna describe to you what, what you're looking at. What you're seeing is essentially what the printed version, the preview version of the invoice is gonna look like. You have a drawer on the left-hand side that you can close and open by clicking on manage. That part's a little bit awkward. I hate the fact that I close it, but then I have to move my cursor over to manage to click on it. I think that might be a little bit of a design flow. I think manage makes more sense to have on the left-hand side. But again, you're watching me criticize this on the fly, something I wasn't even supposed to be looking at, something that someone else got it for whatever reason, okay? Um, so that's the main thing. Uh, you close it on the left hand side. You have to click on manage on the right side to do that. There's a button for all layout. So if you don't like that, you could probably go back to the regular version. I'm afraid that if I click on that, I can't get back to it. And then I won't give Kathy a chance to play with it some more. So the other, next thing you're gonna see is you're gonna see the invoice number up here. That's fine, fine with me. Uh, that cannot be changed there. You're gonna change it in the box right here, which is the sort of the live edit screen. When you hit plus and when you hit minus, uh, sorry, control plus and control minus to zoom in and out, I think it does a really nice job of doing dynamic zooming. So I think the designers did a good job there. Um, also, it grays out the preview when the zoom is too much. I like that too, kind of letting you know, hey, you have a zoom issue, not a design issue. So this is when I did control plus and control minus or command plus, command minus, if I happen to be in a Mac. I'm gonna click on invoice settings, then I'm gonna click on invoice details. So the first thing you see is my ability to uh, enable and disable certain fields. Again, what I love about this is that it's all happening on the fly. I'm enabling and disabling the fields on the fly. What's wrong with this though, is that I don't get to tell it whether or not this is the, the internal version for me to enter that data and not the external printable version for the customer to see. There's no distinction on view for the user and be able to use and access that data point and view for the customer. In other words, if you enable it for you to see it, you're also enabling it for the customer to see it. So there's no distinction there. So that I, I think that's missing. If I click on table, only thing you can add here is a box for SKU and a box for service date, so you can have additional service date and SKU boxes there. Service date seems to be working fine. SKU, I don't think it's doing anything. So I think that just might be broken as of now. I don't know if maybe I have to enable SKUs somewhere else. Maybe I have to enable SKU in the settings. Actually, let's check on that. Let me get out of here for a second. See if maybe that's the issue, because was, it, was, it was killing me. I was clicking on SKU and it wasn't doing anything. So. Could it be that I'm, yeah, so it's, SKU is turned on. But for whatever reason, on this mode, when I, um, when I turn off and on SKU, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. So I, I, I don't know, I don't know. I get, I get, if Intuit were to call me and say, hey, we're gonna release this, can you check it for me? I could point these things out, but that's not how Intuit works. But they basically just release it and see what happens. And, and they wait for me to criticize it publicly 
like this. Uh, it's a weird dynamic that we have. Anyway, so I get to pick my customer from my customer menu. There's an add new button. The new button com comes in as a drawer, which is nice. I like the drawer, of course. The challenge I have with this is I, I fear that the drawer on the right-hand side is not as complete as the pop-up window that has all the tabs and all the available uh, places for me to add additional information. As a matter of fact, I can tell you right off the bat, it's missing stuff. Like I can't add, I can't add uh, terms in here, for example, custom terms. So I'm, I'm already missing uh, information on the new customer creation uh, box, the drawer that comes in on the right-hand side. Again, why they do these things, I don't know. Okay, but um, but it's cool that it, it's it's a drawer. I like that, but I hated the fact that it's missing that piece of information. There's an edit uh, company button right here, which is cool, which allows you to change your your business phone number, your business email, your business address. I love that because otherwise it just you have to click so many other places to try to get to that. So I think they nailed it there. Uh, the the logo here is on the right hand side. All you gotta do is just click on that and and get a logo from your computer, upload it there. I created a logo really quick in Photoshop so we see something. Uh, and then here, you can change the invoice number so you can put whatever invoice, invoice number you want. You can change the terms. You can change invoice date. Again, you do have access to what seems to be all the fields or most of the fields. Um, here on the product and service, you get a drop down menu just like you normally do. When I click on add new, and this is the part that just drives me crazy. When I click on add new, I get a new different drawer. And I'm used to, when I create new items, I'm used to control, you know, or at least I know how to configure those items. The problem I have with these new drawers, again, I know they're beta testing and, and, and they're, 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 they're A-B testing and they're trying to see how, what people think. But I'm telling you right off the bat, I, you know, we, we don't like it when you take away features. So the new item creation on the fly from this screen is broken in my opinion because it doesn't give me all the same information I had before. And the new customer creation also is broken. Again, I'm criticizing something I shouldn't because this wasn't meant for me to look at. And I'm going to hear from into it saying, hey, what are you doing? You weren't supposed to be looking that uh, even worse showing it in a webinar. But you know what? This is uh, my way of giving feedback and also getting you guys ready. So when 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 your QuickBooks file magically has this feature or you let's say you're an accountant and your client has that feature, you you're in, you're aware of kind of what's going on. You're not completely caught by surprise. Okay? Like it always usually ends up happening. Um, so it's pretty cool you can you can click on add product or service here on the bottom so you can add essentially more lines and delete them. That's pretty neat. Um, you don't get the ability to resort them the way you do with the traditional invoicing uh, screen. So I actually dislike that. I, I want my ability to manually resort lines back. Uh, the box for description is at the bottom. That's nice. I, I have nothing against that. I, I, I think there's some value to having sort of a, a, a clear um, description. One thing that's really interesting really interesting, which is sort of brand new <clears throat> to QuickBooks Online world, is this concept of uh, changing whether you charge by the unit, by the hour, or a flat rate. This is brand new. Like in the QuickBooks Online world, we've never seen the option to change the unit of measure per se, okay? Uh, that has never been changed. Now, is this a prelude to potentially having a unit measure? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but um, but this is it's neat the fact that we get some options there. So I really do like that. I don't know what unit or hour. I don't know what the difference means. This might just be simply something just for display to make it easier for the customer to know. So this would be like an each or an hour, but they both just mean each or unit. And then flat just means take away the quantity and just go straight to the price. I like that. I don't think this is really a precursor to units of measure. I don't think this is absolutely a precursor to multiple units of measure, but maybe it could. Who knows? But I like, I like the idea. The idea is going well so far. Okay. There's three little dots here that, where you can click edit saved item. And I, I don't know what this does. I don't know if this is to, to create a new item. I really don't understand too much what this means. Um, so there's this, I don't know what this means. Uh, the edit 
save item. I guess you're editing the item on the fly. I don't know, but the problem is I can't even choose the other stuff. Um, so I would have to like literally go to uh, like the, the account name or something like that. This is obviously for a novice user, for one that doesn't know account mapping. And I get it, you know, like this is more of a, like a small business mode, let's call it that. Okay, so down here we have a, um, you know, some instructions, you know, of, of how you want to get paid and note uh, to customer. What I'm missing here, so the, the, tell your customer how you want to get paid is a comment on the payment for the payment platform. Uh, note to customer, that's your, your customer memo, but I'm missing my internal invoice memo. So I have no place here to do my internal invoice memo, which obviously I dislike. Again, feels like it took away something in the process, okay? So that's pretty much what it is. Um, th there's uh, this thing called email view here in the top where basically it now shows you what the email is going to look like. Uh, so you get, to, again, you get a quick preview without having to go into another screen of that. Here, view details, that's where you actually get to see the payment portal, which is not working right now, but it should work for the customer. And then um, under PDF view, you get to see live what the PDF is going to look like. Now, this is awesome. This is particularly awesome. Now, I can't edit when I'm on PDF view. I can't change dollar amounts or add products, which is okay, but I can add uh, columns. Now, for some reason, SKU and service date are not working in the PDF view, but I know the invoice number, invoice date, terms, and due date, this stuff was working correctly, and they shipped too. So, like, the fact that I'm clicking on these things, and I might be doing it too fast, I'm going to do a little bit slower, and it's changing my PDF view on the fly, that's pretty awesome. Again, the shipping fee and the discount uh, uh, didn't seem to be working well. Uh, you can change the color, uh, like a sort of a color scheme and a font. You can do that, but I can't change or move any of my layout. So that really is it. Uh, there's one more thing worth showing, which I think is email view and then save and send. So when you go to the next screen, the save and send, you get the ability to then see the email of the customer you're going to send to. The problem with this is that I didn't get that box to edit that email in the previous screen. So that's kind of frustrating to me because I kind of want to know what that email is prior to the screen, but at least I get to see it here. And then if I have multiple from emails, there's a drop down here in the top. So if you, you can set up multiple from emails, uh, especially if you have a Gmail account and start configuring uh, those. So that's pretty cool as well. I haven't, I've never done this before, this piece the multiple from emails, but again, it's a precursor to what's about to come. So long story short, you're witnessing a feature that um, you've, 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 a feature that might come at some point soon, might come to a couple clients, might come to multiple clients uh, or, 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 or users for that matter, but you're getting sort of, a lot of you are getting first look at that. And thanks to Kathy and her YouTube channel, I got my first look as well. And I told her, please give me access to this so I can discuss it in, uh, in the webinar. Okay, so in back in the slides, you do have the list of my observations. So if you want to go back to that and see kind of what, what I thought about that. We're going to move on to MailChimp integration with QBO. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to a couple of slides of I took during the setup process. And then I'm going to go inside my MailChimp account. I actually use MailChimp and in QBO and kind of show you how those two things interact. So the first thing I'm going to just go through is that the, the MailChimp QBO integration is marked as beta. So that means it's, it's still work in progress, but as far as I know, it's available to everyone. I mean, it was in the Super Bowl commercial, so I, I would doubt it that it would limit availability after they, they went in the biggest platform ever and, um, and talked about QBO plus MailChimp. The app integration lives in MailChimp. That means that you don't, you don't make the connection from QuickBooks. You make the connection from MailChimp. Doesn't make much of a difference at the end, but it's something to, to point out. The integration is free. Like there's obviously no cost for the integration, but it requires a, a MailChimp account. You have to have a paying MailChimp account. Uh, it's available in all versions of QBO. So it's not QBO advanced only, thank God. Um, and it's, uh, unidirectional data integration. So you cannot go from MailChimp to QBO, which right now I think is a good thing. Um, 
But if you use MailChimp for e-commerce, because some people, uh, they, they sell their products and services through MailChimp, that stuff cannot integrate yet. Um, and obviously, they need to work on that because that might have been the only real reason to buy MailChimp, you know, is to be able to get the e-commerce business from it. But so far, you can get your QuickBooks customers and send them into MailChimp so you can run campaigns. The data points I've noticed, you can sync name, email, company name, address, phone number, and most importantly, invoice and sales receipt totals. That's the key. That's what makes this different. And we'll discuss that when we do the live demo. So you log into MailChimp, you go into in integrations, click on manage, and click on find new integration. You're going to search for QuickBooks. Search for QuickBooks. Once you search for QuickBooks, you click on, on, uh, on QuickBooks. Again, if you want to get access to the slides, go into the chat box uh, or the description box, uh, and there's a link to download the slides. So those slides are available to you. They are Google Slides, so you can download them um, in your computer if you want to. So you click on the, on the link that says QuickBooks on it, QuickBooks Online, rather. Then you're going to click on Connect Now. Pretty simple process. Then you're going to notice, and when you click on Connect Now, uh, the QuickBooks Online integration beta turns on. And the first thing that it will ask you is select an audience. So if you never used MailChimp before, this really means nothing to you. But if you use MailChimp, you know that you're probably going to want to create a separate audience for your QBO customers. Or if you already have an audience for your QBO customers, an audience is basically a group of contacts. For your QBO customers, you can use a an existing one. So generally, I'll create a new audience just for this, and I did for the testing. And then you're going to see in the bottom, uh, once you go back into the settings, which audience is connected to. So every new QuickBooks customer that gets created, it will be pushed into that MailChimp audience. Once you follow through with the connection, you do the standard app connectivity where you tell it which is a company file and you authorize uh, QuickBooks to connect to MailChimp or or vice versa. And once you fully connect it, you're going to go back into that integrations manage setting and you're going to see in the bottom a progress bar for all those contacts being copied. It took like three minutes for me. And then once it's fully connected, it, it will say test connection. When you see test connection, that means it's fully connected. And in the bottom, it says successfully connected to your QuickBooks online file. Then once it's connected, you're going you're gonna to go into that audience, the QBO important audience that I just created, and you're going to see a big QuickBooks logo with a settings button that will take you back into the integration settings. Now, what's worth pointing out is the lifetime sales of the customers and the average order value, invoice uh, sales receipt value, will show up in here. We'll calculate in here. And then in the bottom of the contacts information, it's every single transaction. So you can click on that and it takes you straight into QuickBooks. So let's open that up. So let me go into my, um, let me switch to my company file and then log into MailChimp. It's really, I mean, I've been a MailChimp customer for a very long time, even before, we're talking about 2014 maybe. And before I even fathomed the concept of Intuit buying MailChimp, which is still kind of crazy, um, just conceptually, like what is an accounting software doing with an email marketing company? Um, now that I see them in, in, integrated, I start seeing, you know what? There's some interesting value here. So anyway, I'm in uh, MailChimp. I, I'm in my audience, my QBO imported customers. And this is that big QuickBooks logo I mentioned to you in settings. This is where you would go and where I sh uh, the same thing I showed you in the screenshot is where you can uh, come here and change, uh, I mean, number one, confirm which connection is, uh, the fact that it's connected to a QuickBooks Online file, and this is where you could change the audience that is synced to. Once it's synced, you know, it just it's always going to hit that audience. So right now I can't change it anymore, but if you go back into the slides, you'll see that you had the option to change the audience. So here's my audience. It uh, downloaded 129 contacts from QBO. If I click on that, essentially what I'm going to see, it's all of my QuickBooks online contacts. Now, what's really cool about this, I'm going to scroll to the right a little bit. Take a look at this uh, column that says revenue. This gives me the revenue of every customer. Now, I can't customize to 
last year's revenue or last month's revenue or average monthly revenue. This is just lifetime revenue. Would be nice, you know, to be able to kind of change what those columns look like. And if there's a way to do it, I have no clue. But um, here's where you get to choose. And I can, you know, show less information here if I just wanted to kind of see less columns so you can see um, that revenue on one column without me having to scroll. So that's pretty interesting. Now, I, I'm going to show you, I'm going to go into this customer here, this customer, uh, which is basically me, myself, and the revenue, and I'm going to go into QuickBooks Online so we can see where this information is being fed from. So I'm going to go into QuickBooks Online. This is the QuickBooks Online file that is synced. I'm going to go into my customers. So let me go into my customers. And um, I forgot which is the customer for this, but we'll find out in a second. Oh, AAA Construction right here. AAA Construction. So if you look at the history of this customer, let me zoom out a little bit. And I do a filter and I only show, let's say, invoices. So let's do all the invoices and go to apply. You see all these invoices here, this uh, 500,000 um, worth, that's the information that's coming over. Now, I don't know, you know why it says 569 here and why it says uh, 521 here. There might be a limit on the amount of years of data that uh, MailChimp brings. There's no documentation anywhere that tells me exactly uh, which, you know, which years are being looked at, but I can confirm that's approximately right. There's an amount of invoices and sales are coming over. So how is this valuable? Well, this is where, that's a, I guess it's a big question. Like, wh why does it matter? Like, why do I want QuickBooks customers to be in MailChimp? Well, because you could do something interesting like invoicing a particular select group of your customers. So I can go to new, I can go to new segment and say, you know what? I'm going to invoice all my customers that have spent a total of more than, let's say, $100, right? And then I go to preview segment, and then out of the 130 contacts, it went uh, down to 30. So now I can send them a different message that someone that hasn't spent any money or spent less than $100. Or I can go the other way. I can go to edit segment, and I can put um, spent a total of less than, let's say, $20. So any customers that spend less than $20, there's 46. So I can now send them an email with a particularly different message. So again, you can, based on that information, and it's not enough, I, I wish you could bring more information, like a uh, number of jobs or, again, average, average monthly invoicing or last time we invoiced them. None of this information it's in here, like I don't have, you know, last invoice date. That would be, or could it, let's see. Uh, purchase date, let's do that. So purchase date is after. So in this case, it's not last purchase date. So th oh, this will tell me only if the customer purchased. So let's say, let's experiment here. So purchase date, not within the last, let's say, 90 days. As a matter of fact, I think this might be, what I was saying, it didn't do it, but it does do it. Uh, purchase date now within the last 90 days. So if I hit preview, it tells me all the customers that have not bought from me in the, okay, so this is actually great. Let's do 30 days and go to preview segment, 129. Let's say they haven't bought from me. Purchase not within 30 days, right? That means what about in the last, let's say 100 days? Some ones I haven't purchased, so I'm not sure if this is working, let's say, uh, 365 days, so they haven't bought from me in the past year. Okay, yeah, so it is, seems to be working. I don't know this sample file with a bunch of data. Who knows, you know, how accurate this is, but 40 contacts right here is the number of customers that haven't bought from me in a year. Again, and I have the information here. I would save the segment, create a campaign, and email all of them. I mean, I would, I don't want to make this into a MailChimp webinar, but that's essentially what, uh, what it is. But Yes, this is just really, really, really cool, I think. It's really, really cool. All right. So um, you can connect your MailChimp account with any QuickBooks online file, whether it's the accountant's file or the small business owner's file. That doesn't change, right? So as long as it's an active QuickBooks online file with data, 
you can connect uh, to a MailChimp account. What I suspect is one MailChimp account per QuickBooks Online file. So you, you can't, you, I don't think you could take my MailChimp file and download uh, multiple companies' contacts into one MailChimp file. I, I, don't, I don't think you can do that. Um, so, uh, but it would be interesting, right? If I'm running three or four companies and I want to combine my customer data. All right, so let's switch gears here to QuickBooks Online Accountant on categorized transaction client collaboration. Now, because I would have to log in and log out several times to show you the entire process, I'm going to show you the screenshots and then I'm just going to show you the screen that it starts from. So first thing you would do is when you're logging into your clients, let's say you're an accountant and you're logging into your client's QBO file, you're going to go into where it says books review. And you're going to go into transaction review or transaction list and you're going to see a group of transactions called uncategorized transactions. Every transaction under uncategorized transactions will show up in that list. Then you can choose one or several of them and then the black action bar in the top, the, the batch action bar in the top will ask you, do you want to reclassify these or you want to ask your client about them? So once I click on ask client, then a drawer comes in on the right-hand side where I say, hey, Mr. Customer, there's a bunch of transactions here, one or many, however, uh, can you please tell me what this is, right? So when you click on share, it goes into your workflow as sort of a pending question or pending collaboration or pending request. Then you're going to see where it says client info. It says waiting, which basically means the customer or the small business owner has not replied to your request. So all the ones that they have replied, you'll see something there. The ones that haven't will simply just say waiting. Okay. Then your customer gets an email saying, hey, your accountant wants you to log in into QuickBooks and respond to a whole bunch of pending items. If they click on responding QuickBooks, it logs into their QuickBooks file and it goes into the My Accountant tab. That's where it goes. It goes into My Accountant tab. Now, you can't choose the, 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 the category that triggers these. It, it, it only works with uncategorized expenses. The, the official QuickBooks generated, created uncategorized expenses. So if you put things in Ask My Accountant, or whatever, um, it, it won't pick them up. It needs to be in on categorized expenses. So if you are an Ask My Accountant person, like I am, as a matter of fact, I, I, I have a trademark pending to own Ask My Accountant for my line of merch. I sell shirts that say Ask My Accountant on it through my YouTube website. So I'm a big fan of Ask My Accountant. Trust me when I tell you that. Um, but, um, but what I do or what I've done is to rename the uncategorized expenses default account, rename that to Ask My Accountant. That actually solves the issue. That solves the entire issue. That's how you can do it, okay? Um, all right, so, so the customer gets the email. They click on Respond to QuickBooks. Now I'm, this is a screenshot of what it looks like when the customer logs in. This is under the My Accountant tab on the left-hand side, and it's sitting there as a to-do list in your request list. So... If there's 20 transactions, it would say zero of 20, okay? Then on the right-hand side, you're gonna see a drawer comes up and it tells you, okay, these are all the transactions that your customer is asking about. You, you, the customer has the option to add a comment. Now, the problem with this, which I, I, I'm kind of, it's one of the things that drives me crazy about this interface is if the customer comments on, on that, this is a comment on the request not a not a comment on the transaction. So the, the box in the bottom under comments is for the entire request that could contain one or more transactions. Again, right? So it could contain one or more transactions. So the proper thing to do is not to go into comments, is to click on, uh, on open. So unfortunately, that's just difficult for the customer to go, yeah, what they're asking me to do is, is, is it's open. That button should actually say um, answer or add comments or something like that. That comment section at the bottom tends to be a little bit misleading and you kind of have to train your clients because I, I tested it and my clients ended up writing all the stuff in the comments and it took me a while to find it. So once they open that drawer, uh, they can also upload the invoices. So if the customer has a, an invoice or a receipt or whatever, they can upload it. So me as an accountant, I can, I can see it. Unfortunately, 
the the document uploaded doesn't get attached to the transaction. It gets attached to the request. So I would have to then download that and then attach it to the tra underlying transaction because a request could contain multiple transactions. And an up a document upload is not tied to the transaction, it's tied to the request. So it's something that needs to be worked out into it needs to like now really strongly think about, okay, do we make this uh, a group of transactions requested or do we make them single? There's probably value for both because if it's, there's a whole bunch of Home Depot, Home Depot transactions, for example, that I'm asking about and the customer, let's say, uploads a statement for Home Depot that contains a bunch of information, then that could make sense because it's one attachment for multiple transactions. But but more likely than not, if the customer is going to upload something, they're going to upload the actual receipt. What Intuit is a guessing and assuming at this point is that if the customer wanted to upload the receipt, they would have done it on the underlying transaction in the first place. In my opinion, Intuit has way too much faith on end users. Uh, but but I think that's why they're they're doing it this way. So when they actually click on open, which is, as I mentioned earlier, you should click on open, not in the comments. When you click on open, that's when the customer, the end user, the small business owner, goes into describe what you bought and just put a comment there. Subscription magazine, whatever they want to put in there. The customer doesn't get a drop-down menu of available vendors, doesn't get doesn't get anything to confuse the customer. Just one box to, to say, give it your best shot. Tell me what this is. Now, that stuff doesn't go in the memo. It doesn't go anywhere. It just sits there, in there, okay? Now, the request gets marked as completed. Again, a request could contain multiple transactions. Then, back, I'm the accountant now. I get an email saying, hey, your customer left a comment. You can now go back and see what that is, okay? So, I click on uh, respond in QuickBooks. Now, I'm back logged in as an accountant. There's a list of all my uncategorized transactions where it says client info. There's the comment from my customer. Again, that does not go into the memo, does not replace the memo. That would be cool, but it doesn't. It just shows up there as a comment. Then I get to click on that and reclassify it to whatever I think the correct thing is. And if the payee was missing, I also get to click on add payee and I can add the payee or replace the payee uh, all from this screen. Okay, so it, it is really interesting. Again, this is trying to compete with a lot of apps that already exist in this category. I think uh, uh, something like Bookkeep or something like that. Not Bookkeep, but there's um, there, there's some sort of bookkeeping something app that does it. Zenit uh, does this. Uh, Uncat, that's a big one. Uncat does this. So there's there's been other third-party developers trying to solve this issue. And obviously, this is into its first attempt to fix in this, this is probably not gonna be as strong as a third party app that dedic has dedicated the last four or five years just to solve this problem, in my opinion, into it probably should have just bought on cat and you know got all the employees, all the learnings and everything through it. But it's into into it has enough money where they can make it better than on cat and completely um, you know kill off this category of third party collaboration apps for accountants anyway. So if I was uh, and on, on cat or or any of those other apps, I would be strongly fearing this or looking for ways to add more value because uh, this is into its first attempt and it's not bad. It's missing stuff, but it's not bad. I actually like it quite a bit. Okay. All right, let's move on to a QuickBooks announcement of, this is for pro advisors or for, for people that have QuickBooks online accountant account, a new revenue sharing program. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of money on this because it's not active yet. Uh, supposedly, it's active in the late summer, early fall of 2022. What they have announced, this, this is in an official into a webinar, what they have announced is, instead of you creating your clients as uh, wholesale clients or pro-advisor discount clients, which by the way, if you create a client as an accountant, if you create a client in your QBO, a, in your QuickBooks and accountant account, and you pay for it, you, the accountant, pay for it in behalf of the customer, you will have a 30% for life discount on that file, right? That's the concept of the what's called the ProAdvisor uh, discount, preferred ProAdvisor preferred pricing discount. What Intel is doing now is saying, hey, if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to pay for your client's account, you just want to create the account and then 
hand it over to the client so they, they put their credit card number and they pay into it directly and into it owns the customer, let's, let's call it that. Then into it will pay you a referral fee, revenue sharing of 30% of the value of that customer, whatever the customer paid with into it, net of whatever discounts into it gives them for the first 12 months, including payroll, not including merchant services. I don't know if they'll add merchant services later. Who the heck knows? But including payroll. So the, the QBOs, core subscription, and payroll will come into this category. Uh, they didn't say anything about QuickBooks Live. If the customer adds QuickBooks Live, if they will pay you a percentage of that too. It's assumed that if you're an accountant adding people, that they, the customer doesn't need QuickBooks Live, but they haven't mentioned whether or not they'll do revenue sharing on that. Um, the client pays the promotional 50% discount for three months, just like they normally do when they go to quickbooks.com, and then it jumps to full price. And as an accountant, you get 30% of whatever the customer paid the customer in the first 12 months. After 12 months, you don't get paid. If the customer cancels before the 12 months, you get paid up to the point of what the customer paid. If the customer pays a year in advance, I assume you get a lump sum for that year in advance payment. If the customer pays a year in advance, and then cancels and gets a refund, do you get clawed back that, that commission? I have no clue. I have no idea. So that, that part I don't know. They're probably still figuring that stuff out. Full disclosure, I am a QuickBooks reseller. I'm a QSP, QuickBooks solution provider. I've been for many years. I've sold QuickBooks online with a revenue sharing bounty. Not, it's a one-time fee for years. It's an extremely lucrative business. For me, because of my YouTube channel, my company is the biggest QuickBooks online sales company in the U.S. At least that's what the awards say. So something like that is it's devastating for my business model, but it's amazing for pro advisors. So if you're an accountant, a pro advisor, and you're not part of the reseller channel, I think this is a great thing for you because I know many of you want just a customer to pay QuickBooks on their own, and then customer hires you whenever they need to hire you. You don't need to be charging them monthly for the QBO subscription plus whatever your services are. That's very difficult to manage. I hate that business model. I never did wholesale billing. My, my partners did in the firm. We got maybe like 90 clients on wholesale billing, but I personally never did it. I never liked it. Um, I, I always went through, customer, you pay for your own QuickBooks. That's your problem, right? So that's something that that's interesting in there, okay? Um, and something to add, which is probably what's going to make some people mad, is any customers you added last year, two years ago, five years, all that loyalty, all that like, amazing new customers that you brought into Q the QBO platform, would anybody get paid for that? The answer is no. The answer is you will get paid for new customers, brand new QBO subscriptions you bring in. Now, one question that's probably gonna arise is, what if we move a client from wholesale or from uh, pro advisor discount into self-pay? Will they pay, pay us a commission for that? I don't know. That's an extremely good question to ask and probably something they're thinking about and they did not mention this in the live webinar, okay? All right. Um, that's it for that slide. And again, it's not active yet, so there's really nothing else to, to discuss. All right, let's talk about QuickBooks Online. Advance, advance only. What I'm about to show you only works in advance. Please don't go in the comments and say, I don't see this feature. It's only for advance. Um, we're going to talk about expense management. Expense management is really cool. It's under the banking tab. Uh, you're going to click on a big button that says expense management settings. You get to add the users, basically, you're gonna add an employee or a vendor who is an expense management or timesheet only user. Um, you basically invite them into your QBO as a limited user. Um, and the invitation process is the exact same. And uh, you would see there's a new role called time tracking and expense management user. When you see that role, that means that the only thing they can do is add time and add expenses. The other really cool thing about this this is innovative, really innovative, is you can have categories or sort of 
a remapped chart of accounts, let's call that, okay? Where you are gonna use simplified, easy to use version of your chart of accounts for these users. So, um, so if you don't want the users to have a list of your entire chart of accounts, where they shouldn't, especially if you got third-party vendors submitting expenses and you have a list of bank accounts, obviously that's a no-no. You should not give a chart of accounts. You have this sort of pseudo alias chart of accounts where you limit what that user can choose when they categorize or, or quote unquote give that expense a category. Then when it comes in, the QuickBooks user, the, the, the accountant user, the one with, with the rights to the chart of accounts, sees the translation between the nickname or the alias of this category and the actual mapped chart of accounts. And then when that comes in, uh, they get to categorize that. So this is what um, the email looks like for your employee or contractor that does not have a QBO account that gets invited to be an expense management user. Once you know they create an account, just the same way you create an account in the world of QuickBooks. And the cool thing is they can log in through the phone app. So you can have a phone app with QuickBooks online or you can go through the web and have this limited time tracking and expense management only access. That's what a user can do, only does those two things. So the user clicks on go to expenses. They click on add expenses. I don't have screenshots of the phone app, but it's very similar. Then they get to either do enter expense info manually. So if, the, if they don't have an underlying document, like a receipt or an invoice, they just go straight to the screen without uploading. Or they can click up, upload receipt. So they just click and drag the file. Or if you're on a phone, take a picture of the file. Then QuickBooks reads that receipt using the same technology from the banking receipt management feature and tries to read some of the information, tries to automate some of that data entry. Then it's time for you to put whatever information you're gonna put. You're gonna double check the dollar amount is correct or type in the dollar, dollar amount. There's a little checkbox that says, I need to be reimbursed. So the cool thing is if you check, I need to be reimbursed, then the implication is you're telling the QuickBooks user that you need to create a bill after you receive this expense report. If you don't click, I need to get reimbursed, essentially what you're doing is you're documenting an expenditure you made using a company credit card, a company debit card, or company cash, right? But if, if the employee is paying this out of pocket, they're gonna click on, I need to get reimbursed. An employee or vendor, by the way, either one works. Then they're gonna go into category and they're gonna pick within your limited list of chart of accounts you gave them. If they can't find a category that makes sense to them, they just pick none. The vendor name is not a drop-down menu, so they get to type the vendor name, just free and clear typing. That stuff needs to then be resolved in the QuickBooks side. And then there's a box in the bottom that says uh, business purpose, which is basically your notes, your comments. So once you submit to review, it shows up in there that's been submitted to review. So when the user in their phone app or in their, um, in their web-based version of this expense management only access, for employees, they get to see all the expense reports they submitted. Um, one thing to mention, I, I, I used to use uh, Expensify for a couple of customers. The way Expensify worked in similar apps is you upload a whole bunch of transactions and then you group them together and create one expense report. This is not doing that. What it does is it just sends every transaction at its own transaction. So you cannot bundle them. Like one of my issues with this is if I submit, let's say, six receipts, I can't then take six receipts and create a single bill to reimburse for all six. So I either enter them all as individual transactions or create one expense in which you upload um, a, a picture of a whole bunch of receipts, I guess, and then just lump sum it there. So there's no way to like upload individual ones and aggregate them into a single uh, sort of expense report. Not yet, anyway. This is, again, this is also the first release or the first version of this. Okay, so then once you send it, um, I'm the accountant or I'm, let's say I'm the QuickBooks user and I get an email saying, hey, um, Hector sent a uh, expense for approval, right? So if you click on review expense, it opens up QuickBooks in the receipt um, sub-tab inside banking. You're gonna have a list of all the pending receipts, which looks identical to the pending receipts you upload through the regular receipt upload process or 
the phone app user process. You open that up, and then you get to choose between document type, whether it's an expense transaction or a bill. You, you give it the actual uh, payee, like who you're gonna pay, which is gonna be your vendor or your customer if you're gonna reimburse them. Dollar amount comes in, uh, customer name comes in under, I mean, vendor name comes under description. Okay, so who they paid, Home Depot or whatever, doesn't get put anywhere. Just because who you're reimbursing, it's the actual individual, the employee or the customer. Uh, you can add a bill number, you can job cost it, you can add it to a customer, the class, location, there's no tag here for some reason. Again, why does Intuit do that? <laughs> they don't, don't make certain um, features available. Then on the memo, it says your employee requested to get reimbursed because they hit the checkbox and then the employee note to fix the muffler that I put in there. Then you click on next. And what's really cool, I think they did a good job here, is instead of going straight to the bill creation, it goes to the matching. So just in case I already created a bill for this, or already entered a transaction of some sort in my banking workflow, it's gonna allow you to match it, I mean to, to match it to something that has already been entered into QuickBooks to avoid double entry. Okay, and the, and, the, uh, and the matching screen looks very similar than the QuickBooks matching screen. Then you click on Create Bill, and it creates a bill the same way you're used to. And if, again, if there was a document uploaded in the expense management, that one does come into the transaction. I mentioned earlier that in the, if you upload a document into the client collaborator, into the uncategorized client collaborator, the document doesn't come in. That's a different circumstance. In here, the document comes in because it's tied to the underlying transaction or bill that was entered via the phone or the web during the expense management process. So let me, uh, how much time do we have? Okay, we, we have time. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into QuickBooks and do a quick demo of this, so at least you get an idea for what it looks like. So I'm gonna go into Banking, Receipts. Then you're gonna see the tab on the right-hand side that says receipts. This is where all your receipts, that one you uploaded via the regular receipt process using the phone app or through the screen, and the ones that go in through expense management. Again, expense management is meant for non-QuickBooks user within your organization that you want them to upload receipts either for documenting them into GL or to get reimbursed. I'm gonna click on expense management settings. Here where it says manage employees, I'm gonna click on that first. So manage employees, I'm gonna click on add employees so I can show you what happens. We go into the new user creation process. I'm gonna X, X out of here for a second and I'm gonna click on roles and then I'm gonna show you there is a role here. Actually, it's not here, but there's a role here for time tracking uh, user and there's, there's sort of a, there's no specific role here for time tracking and expense management because you can't pick it per se in here, but when you create it through that workflow, it does create this time tracking and expense claims. So this is a special role that gets created only when you start the new user creation process here where it says receipts and click on um, expense management, add employees and add employees. Only when you create it through there and you pick who your employee or your vendor is, like you pick from your vendor list or your employee list, once you pick it from there, then it creates a new user that does that. And it doesn't go against your five users or, uh, actually, this is for advanced only. So it doesn't go against your 25 users because uh, this is a this is sort of a um, time tracking or expense management. It's not a regular QuickBooks user per, per se. Okay. All right, so that's uh, that's it. I don't think there's anything else to, to look at at this point. Uh, let me just, um, let me make sure we don't miss anything here. Okay, so yeah, so if so, this is what the screen looks like, just like your regular um, um, uh, screen. You get to choose whether you wanna enter a receipt. If you do receipt, that means your employee is not getting reimbursed. They're just letting us know what's going on, per se. Uh, then we get to pick the bank account that it was paid for. Now, why in this drop-down menu there's income accounts and stuff? I don't, don't ask. Yeah, but it should, should only be uh, bank accounts or credit card accounts. So uh, then we get to pick uh, the payee, the actual vendor, uh, the dollar amount, the account in this case, the actual expense account, 
and then you get the job costed or not, or you can even split it and go into multiple lines. So really, really powerful stuff. You get to pick whether you want it to be a bill to reimburse or a receipt. So not bad for the first version. Of course, this is not nearly closely as powerful as Expensify. There isn't any layered um, a, a approval process. There's no direct payment process from here. Like if you have bill.com or Melio activated into QuickBooks, you could then go into your bill payment screen and pay your bill through your bill.com or Melio platform. Um, but there's no like within the expense management module or the receipt, uh, the receipts management module, there's no way to mark it as reimbursed or make the direct payment from here. This is where, it, it, again, apps like uh, Expensify and stuff like that or Harvest or whatever the other ones concur, the ones that are in this category, that's where they defer. They're sort of soup to nuts, um, expense and reimbursement uh, process. Okay. All right. Next uh, here, we have two more features to showcase. The next one is QuickBooks Online Advanced plus PandaDoc. So PandaDoc is a, is a third-party app. It costs between $30 and $60 a month, I believe. And it's an, it's an app that gets used for a lot more than just customizing estimates, okay? We, QuickBooks just happens to build a partnership with them, and you could use their platform to customize um, a QuickBooks online estimate. Now, they also have done deeper integration than normal, which basically means you get to see within the QuickBooks um, UI, you get to see buttons that kind of talk about the integration with other apps, just like the Milio and the previous build.com integration or the T-Sheets integration before they bought QB Time. You see buttons that have to do with uh, the integrated apps. Okay, um, and so you can now to get to see something that says save and send with PandaDoc. So once you connect PandaDoc, you can have multiple templates inside PandaDoc. QuickBooks Online reads the, your template list and you get to choose which template you want. Then you go to preview and send with PandaDoc and then it switches over to a different app. So QuickBooks stays open in one tab, you get a new tab, now you're in PandaDoc. PandaDoc is sort of this free form design screen where you can make your estimates look however you want them to, to look. You can even add introductory pages. You can add presentation. You can add pictures. You can add a whole bunch of things to it. And on the one page for your estimate, it can read all the information from QuickBooks. So let's attempt to demo that. And when I say attempt to demo that is because I am not a PandaDoc user. Okay. And by not being a PandaDoc user, it makes it a little bit harder for me to tell you uh, you know, sort of the in, in and outs of it. But I did create an account for the purposes of understanding what the heck is going on with this PandaDoc. So I have a, a free trial account that I created. I didn't, didn't even have to put a, a credit card on it. And this is my, this is my PandaDoc, a different app um, dashboard. Now in PandaDoc, I can create uh, documents. I can create templates. So right now, these are all my estimates. That, that were sort of brought over from, from QuickBooks, but there are templates. So if I, if I pick any of these templates, I'm gonna pick, for example, this one called Hector Modern, which is the one I was playing with, and I'm gonna log into it, and then I'm gonna edit the template. So I get to do different things with this. So for example, you see this box that says estimate, estimate number. Um, I can start editing some of these things. Okay, I can, I can edit these. Where's the edit button? This crazy place. Here, where's the edit button? Okay, that's the logo. Uh, let me put the logo on the left-hand side. Let me get the, the other box here, okay? I'm gonna put here proposal, proposal, and put this on the right-hand side. And you, you, you're watching me basically edit, uh, you know, on the fly here. Whoops, I didn't wanna do that. As a sort of an extra, extra thing there. I didn't want, can I delete this thing? Yes, I can delete it. Let me insert a, uh, a logo. Okay, there it is. Let me upload here and go to select file and I'll upload a logo here from my computer. Again, this is a different app altogether, nothing to do with QuickBooks. This is PandaDoc, an app that until yesterday, I didn't even know it existed, okay? I did that just to, kind of play around with this. 
Now, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know how to make it smaller. Uh, I, uh, I'm not good enough at Panda Dog to know how to make this smaller. Uh, let me put this on the left hand side and then I'll go to my other box here. Ah, oh, God dang it. Such a weird, such a weird and uncomfortable app to use. Um, you know what? We're going to go ahead and give up on the hope that we can have a logo there because I don't know what the heck is going on with this thing. Okay. So, uh, I changed this to proposal. I can change this to, um, estimated or let's call it uh, pricing date pricing date again I'm just just sort of totally customizing the the estimate so you get a feel for what I'm trying to do here um, and then let's say I want this subtotal to be on the let's say let's say on the left side okay that is awkward but that's where I put it and I want my business name here to be, let's say, uh, somewhere in the top, some some sort of editing. Um, so I put the, my business name up here. I got my other fields here. Notice the brackets. That's going to come into play in a second. So here's my, uh, let's do the, put the signature up here and the estimate message. Okay, I think I think that's good enough. So I played with the estimate to the best of that I that I understood how this darn app works. And I'm sure there's some amazing Panda Dog consultants out there that would say. Hector, the, you, know, you, you could have done that in so many different ways, but I don't, I don't have time for this. So this is the, the, the design that I came up with. Save it, so I'm done with it. I'll close this out. Then I'm back in my QuickBooks estimate, and after that crazy customization that I did over there, I'm going to go to Save and Send to PandaDoc. Again, I apologize for my non-PandaDoc skills. I'm going to click on Save. And actually, let me make this... Um, today's date. That way I'm not messing with the um, anything prior to the closing date. Save and send to PandaDoc. Then this comes up. It tells me which template would you like to use. Hector Modern was the one that I was just editing or attempting to edit. I'm going to go to preview and send to PandaDoc. Okay. Then we're going to give it a second. It should launch the PandaDoc app. It should log me in. And now it should take the underlying estimate data and just throw it in my design. Again, if I was an accountant trying to look for a solution for a customer to have better and more customizable estimates, this could work, but I, I think I gotta take a class on PandaDoc to figure this one out. But you saw all the different um, features that it had. Um, you could change the name of the form. I basically literally picked the location of my company information. Um, I put pricing date date here, so I use a different terminology. I have a signature here. I have my totals and estimates here. So I'm pretty sure that if someone knows how to use PandaDoc well, or it's already using PandaDoc, we'll see, okay, this is awesome. I can get my QuickBooks data in here. I can automate my pretty invoicing, my pretty uh, form creation process. Now, that's what it is. And that's, that's as much as I would like to cover. Uh, one thing I like to add, it's right now it's only on estimates. There's a button up here that says Manage with PandaDoc, letting you know that this estimate was converted to PandaDoc and probably um, used PandaDoc to send it to the customer. Now, it would be really, really confusing if you send this invoice to the customer formatted via PandaDoc and also come into QuickBooks and send it here. So one thing that I think QuickBooks is missing, it's, it's a set of control that prevents someone from sending the the form both in QuickBooks and in PandaDoc. Like, again, you can't have that much faith in QuickBooks users. They're gonna screw things up. So it would be interesting for the app to somehow lock the mechanism from people being able to send the estimates through QuickBooks because they've already been sent through PandaDoc and you're gonna confuse your customer if you send them the same document formatted in two different ways. So that's missing, but it's very promising that Again, if PandaDoc is a great app, happens to be a great app that other people know how to use, designers or whatever, um, and they have these beautiful looking proposals already in there, um, you could really, really do interesting things where you do all the core geeky accounting stuff in QuickBooks, get the dollar amounts, the, the descriptions, save it. It looks like a regular old school estimate, assuming we don't get the, the new system in place, then the one that we preview at the very beginning 
of the webinar, and then get it to look this in, this incredible document in Pandadoc, really beautiful, beautifully designed. Could you attach an engagement letter to an estimate um, in Pandadoc? Yeah, in theory you can. I mean, Pandadoc allows you to do anything really. So you can attach a contract, you can attach disclosures, you can attach pictures, you can do cover letters. There's so, tons of great things to do. And if anyone that knows me that sees this is a Pandadoc consultant, reach out to me. I would love to do a webinar just to show people how Pandadoc works because obviously I'm the worst spokesperson for, Canada, for Pandadoc out there. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about briefly is the new QuickBooks Online Advanced Desktop App for Windows. So many words on this thing. I mean, just like the probability of confusion is just so flipping high. So what QuickBooks Online uh, what, what, what Intuit did, I don't have a screenshot on this. Whoops, I thought I had, oh, okay, I put them in the wrong place. I mean, reordered them. So I had, I had the slide in the wrong place. So what Intuit did is they created, they developed an app that only works for Windows. Maybe there'll be a Mac version soon, who knows, that allows you to open QuickBooks Online Advanced through it. Why Advanced and Advanced only? I don't know. Seems insane to me, honestly because the app is actually completely useless. Like I don't, I don't ever picture anyone working with an app and feeling that they're more effective or more efficient than working in Google Chrome or, 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 or Microsoft Edge or Firefox or whatever. Um, we're not talking about the app that was developed like four years ago that some people might still have it. We're talking about the new advanced app for QuickBooks desktop. Uh, so the new advanced Desktop Windows app for QuickBooks Online Advance. The, the one thing that is, it has going for it, uh, the one thing that's different than anything else is that you can open multiple tabs and have multiple company files open without you having to do that weird um, trick um, where you, you have to um, you do the multiple Chrome users. Now, I'm getting in the live chat at the moment confirmation from two people that is working in all levels, not just advanced customers. Okay. Didn't work for me when I tested it a couple of days ago, but, but, but okay. So uh, if, if that's true, um, into it, well, thank you for at least making the app available in all versions, but I yet get, to, I, I've yet to see the value of using this app where I can do this with Google Chrome. Um, it's a new app. It's, it's going to be buggy. It's going to be more, more buggy than using any sort of, a browser. I would love to know if any of you actually um, sees this app and say, hey, you know what? I, I use this app and this is value for me. Somebody told me that you can, it could, um, you can stay logged in forever. Uh, you can stay logged in forever the whole day and it doesn't log you out. And then you can switch, uh, like the customer switching or having multiple tabs is a little faster. But other than that, I mean, if I want the app to add more functionality, not just to be there for multiple clients. Some people like it. I haven't seen the value of it. So I stand by my statement until I get to see the value on it. Okay, cool. So we're almost done in the 90 minute webinar. So we'll, we'll save best for last. The only thing I've really truly enjoyed from the last five to six months of new feature development in the QuickBooks online world is the custom report builder. And they added this new builder called Pivot Tables, which is mind blowing. I mean, mind blowing as someone that's been using QuickBooks for professionally anyway, for 13 years. Mind blowing from any sort of reporting built into QuickBooks reporting module. I'm an Excel expert myself. I know how to do pivot tables. I'm very proud of my ability to build custom reports in Excel, but this is, this is nice. And the fact that they're just getting started, it's really exciting. So let's go ahead and showcase that. I mean, QuickBooks Online Advanced, again, this is only QuickBooks Online Advanced. I'm gonna go into reports. I'm gonna go into custom report builder and I'll start with an invoice report. So I'm just gonna click on invoice report and then we start with our custom report builder, okay? I'm gonna do here Let's do the last 12 months. And essentially what I'm seeing here is a list of invoices. Now I'm gonna collapse the uh, left navigation bar, zoom out a little bit so I get a little bit more real estate 
I'm gonna pick on the columns what kind of information I want to see. So let's say I wanna see the location. Okay, I wanna see the location of the invoices. So I'm gonna enable location, okay? So now I have invoice date, invoice number, customer name, amount, and where is my location? Did I not check it? Let me search it here. Location, yep, that's enabled. Then I'm gonna customize, go to uh, layout, and I'll bring location here all the way to the beginning. So now I have my location of my invoices, I have my invoice date, my invoice number, I have my customer name. So I can do something really cool here. I can click on pivot table, and I can do, look, for rows, I wanna see my customer name, and then for columns, I want to see my location. And then the values, I will do the amount of the invoice. And literally, with a cup, within a couple of clicks, I get a pivot table. Now, this feature is still missing uh, some like sort of uh, quick fit features to quickly fit the data inside of the screen. So there's a lot of like sort of rearranging data around. But being able to do what essentially is in QuickBooks Desktop a custom summary report where I can pick what dimension I want on rows and what dimension I want on columns, that's just really, really cool. Okay, so again, simple. I get to pick the rows, the columns, and the values are the amount. So it's, it's essentially a custom summary report. And the QuickBooks desktop would be a custom summary report. It's a pivot table, in, for lack of a better term, where you can do um, uh, rows and columns. Now, what's this? I, I speak to the product managers of this uh, particular uh, app or function, it's called it all the time. And I give my feedback and they know what's what's missing anyway. But um, some of the things that I wish I could do at this point, I wish I could, I could print this. Um, I can't, I can only exp uh, you know save it, export it to Excel. But one of the things you notice is when I export it to Excel, um, I'm gonna bring it here, give me a second. When I export it to Excel, which is, I don't have any issues with, um, uh, it, this is ready to be printed, but I don't get, I have to like manually put the title of the report. Um, you know, I, it's just missing some stuff, but at least I get, I, get, I get the data that I want. And then once I move it to Excel, I get to pick, you know, I get to add more stuff to print it. Unfortunately, it's a little bit more work to sort of automate these reports because you have to add headers and footers and notes and dates and all these things. But, but I get the data, which otherwise, I wouldn't, and I get the data faster than exporting the raw data and, and doing the pivot table inside Excel. So I love that, okay? Um, something else that I like about this is, here with this filter, I can remove certain data. So let's say I don't want um, any data that's missing, like if you see right here, which is not specified, it's essentially telling me all the transactions that are missing uh, locations, right? So if I don't wanna see that column, of the missing locations, I can click on filter, go to filter and search for location, and I can put operation, I can put it's not empty. And what it does essentially is, and again, I have to reformat this, which annoys the heck out of me. I wish there was like a button that says fit, out of fit, not, not out of fit, but you can get rid of that, okay? Um, or you can only see that information. So let's do it's empty. And then I can save this report, and I can come up here and just start seeing the possibilities. And I can put um, invoices by customer missing a location. Okay, so all of a sudden this information is relevant. If I'm trying to go back and figure out what stuff is missing locations, I can quickly run a report and do that. Now from the pivot table mode, I can't click at any of these and get a summary. So there's no drill down on the pivot side. However, if I turn the pivot off, I'm going to turn the pivot off, uh, all the filters, all the data points um, stay the way they are. I'm going to go back into filter here and do location. Let's do not empty. And then I'm going to group by location. So essentially I'm achieving something similar than the pivot. Uh, let me bring the dollar amount to uh, here to the left so I can see it. So essentially this is kind of like a pivot. Now unfortunately I can't pick now a column and say, show it to me by customer. I can group it under it, so I can essentially get 
similar information. I don't get a matrix, but I can group by location first, then group by customer, and then I get to see all the transactions inside the customer. And yes, from here, I can click on any of the lines and, and it works in a drill down and it opens up the underlying transaction. So the drill down I'm mentioning that is not working, which I really wish you I had, is when I'm in pivot mode like this, it would be pretty incredible if I could then click on any of these dollar amounts and then go into a list report that shows me all the underlying transactions. Unfortunately, I can't do it through here. So this is a, a Google and Miami office. But if I turn off the pivot table and I go to filter and I go location equals, let's say Miami office, and I'll add that and I'll go to customer equals, uh, was it Google? Google the customer. I wish I had a customer named Google. Give me a second. I got my zoom ins and zoom outs are all out of whack here. So go to add. Okay. So that same 4,000 and change that I couldn't otherwise show, um, in, you know, as a detail report, I can see the details in here and I can export that. But I think that's the one piece that's missing is being able to run now a detail report from a pivot table. That would be really cool. That would be an interesting way of doing um, uh, um, drop down by, uh, to do the drill down by with, uh, within a, a, a pivot table report. Okay, so uh, let's go back to slideshow mode here. And I think that's everything. So there's my email address. If you have any questions and, and comments, um, you know, let me know, you know if, if, if I missed the mark in any of my comments or on any of the features or you think you're in disagree disagreement with me or in strong agreement with me, email me and that just helps. Okay, so next webinar will be in three months. So that's what I'm trying to do every quarter, run a quarterly new features update. So I'm working hard to hunt down new features to showcase and, uh, and show you the next, the next cool things coming up.